Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the Lubbock Chamber's first ever virtual Salute to Ag seminar on this National Ag Day. Obviously, we're gathered virtually due to some tough and unexpected circumstances, but we plan to make the most of it today. And we will have a rescheduled face-to-face -face Salute to Ag luncheon once it's safe for us to do so. My name is Norma Ritz Johnson, Executive Vice President with the Lubbock Chamber of Commerce. Before we get started, I'd like to start us out with a word of prayer, if you'll please join me. Lord, we come before you today on this National Agriculture Day to recognize our nation's farmers, ranchers, and everyone along the way who has a part in working to feed and clothe this world. Our ag industry has never been more important, and we Pray that you'll continue to bless our farmers and ranchers with the ability to provide the food and fiber that we need as this nation and this world weather this global pandemic. Lord, we thank you for even in the face of this pandemic and the challenges it brings, you have blessed us with abundant food to sustain us. Lord, we come before you today to ask you to heal those who are sick and protect the most vulnerable. Bless our healthcare workers with strength and resilience and wrap them in your protective arm. Give our leaders extra wisdom as they navigate this pandemic and economic uncertainty that we face. Lord, reveal to us how we can support those who at this moment are praying for their own employees and livelihoods in this time of uncertainty. Strengthen our faith that it may calm our fears. Fill us with your hope, joy, and peace as we continue to trust in you. In your name we pray. Amen. So just a few housekeeping notes before we continue with our program. First, please let me remind you once again to keep your microphone muted throughout the duration of this webinar. Having an unmuted mic can cause feedback, echoes, or other sound interruptions, and it'll make things more difficult for other attendants to hear. Time permitting, we should have time for a couple of questions at the end of today's presentation. You, you can submit those via the chat function of, of the Zoom webinar, or if you're calling in, you can email your questions to Kyle Jacobson with the Lubbock Chamber at kyle.jacobson at lubbockbiz.org. That's kyle.jacobson with an O at lubbockbiz.org. I'd also like to thank today's presenting sponsor, First United Bank, for their support of the Chamber and for working with us to transition our program to a virtual one today. We have a number of other sponsors who you can find on our website and who we look forward to recognizing at our in-person Salute to Ag Luncheon whenever that time comes. For days now, we have been excited to introduce our speaker today after she agreed to still participate in this event virtually, and her staff was so cooperative with us in rearranging things. But something changed a little more than 12 hours ago, making this introduction especially exciting for us, and I must say, quite an honor. As of the U.S. Senate's confirmation late last night, our speaker, Dr. Mindy Brashears, is the U.S. Undersecretary of Agriculture for Food Safety officially. After all this time, we congratulate her. As such, she is the highest ranking food safety official in the United States. In this role, Undersecretary under, under Brashears leads the nation's regulatory oversight for ensuring that meat, poultry, and processed egg products are safe, wholesome, and accurately, accurately labeled. She also serves as chair of the U.S. Codex Policy Committee and offers expert scientific guidance to the Codex Program, an international food standard setting body of 188 member countries that protect cons consumer health and sets international food standards. standards. Dr. Bashirs is committed to working closely with FSIS leadership to lead with science build relationships and influence behavioral change to protect and promote public health. Under Dr. Brashear's leadership, the FSIS has finalized rulemaking for the modern, modernization of swine inspections 
is in the process of implementing pathogen reduction performance standards through the public rulemaking process and is actively seeking new ways to influence positive behavior change to reduce foodborne illnesses. Prior to joining USDA, Dr. Brashears was a professor of food safety and public health and the director of the International Center for Food Industry Excellence at Texas Tech University. Dr. Brashears has spent her career improving food safety standards to make an impact on public health through research, outreach, and education. She is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and has received numerous awards, including the International Association for Food Protection Laboratorian Award, the American Meat Science Association Distinguished Research Award, the AMSA Distinguished Industry Service Award, AMSA Achievement Award, and was listing the National Provisioner's Top 25 Future Icons in the Meat Industry. She, is an ex she has an extensive publication record in peer-reviewed journals and also holds more than 25 patents for her innovative approaches to improving food safety in the food supply. Dr. Brashears, thank you again for joining us today. If you'll give me just a moment here, I will mute my microphone and turn things over to her for today's presentation. And please remember to keep your microphones muted. Well, thank you so much, Norma, for that very extensive introduction. I appreciate it, very kind introduction. I'm, I'm so excited to be here today. I uh, want to thank the entire Chamber of Commerce for having me here today. I was really looking forward to coming to Lubbock, and I'm going to hold you to the fact that if you're going to have an in-person luncheon, I hope I get another invitation to come back to that. Always love to go to Lubbock, it's home. But I am also very happy that everyone is taking this public health crisis seriously and we're staying apart so we can all do our part to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to protect public health. The last 10 days at the FSIS have been very different from the past year where I've been there. And I'm going to talk about some of those things as well as our, our goals for the, the future in the agency. Okay, there we go. So as Norma said, I have spent my career as a scientist and most of my career has been at Texas Tech University as a professor of food safety and public health. My husband was also a professor there. Uh, we uh, still have our home there. And then the opportunity came to move to Washington, D.C. Uh, this was over three years ago when I received notification that I was being considered for this position. I did not know that it was going to take over three years to get confirmed, but I'm glad I waited it out and I'm very thankful that the Senate took that action last night. Um, you know, the transition is different. Uh, you move to DC and uh, I can assure you that when I go into work on any given morning, no one ever says, hey, did you get caught up in that haboob yesterday? No, that doesn't happen in DC, but that's okay. That's one thing I can say I don't really miss. And, uh, you know, I do miss the sunsets and the people, but there are good things about DC as well. Um, we definitely have good public transportation, although we're not using it now, or I'm not using it. It's, it's slowed down quite, quite a lot because of social distancing. And we do get to have the cherry blossoms and the monuments and lots of historical things. Now, uh, we're not visiting the cherry blossoms again, because of social distancing. I get to uh, experience the old while, uh, or remember the old and experiencing the joy of the new surroundings here in Washington, DC. I do, uh, I am currently on a leave of absence from the university. I do plan to go back there uh, when my time in, in DC is over. I wanna give a shout out to the administration of Texas Tech who have accommodated uh, many changes and, and, and all of the things that I've had to do in order to get here. They've been uh, very supportive and just as anyone else in West Texas, Texas Tech has been very good to our family. So uh, this, this is another slide we had to get changed in the last uh, few hours. Uh, Under Secretary of Food Safety, it's uh, 
uh, whenever I was trying to uh, decide if I wanted to pursue this opportunity, people would ask, what is the undersecretary? And uh, there are a lot of different uh, things that we do on a daily basis. In general, uh, I'm a member of the sub cabinet for uh, the United States, and I work a lot with the Secretary of Ag, and I am the highest uh, public health official in the in the USDA. So we oversee the inspection of the food supply and the safety of the food supply. On any given day, I'll have meetings with the secretary or I will have meetings with industry representatives, different scientists, our group of employees, or I'll be traveling to visit stakeholders and to see what's going on out in the countryside. Uh, it's been quite an opportunity and um, I've been able to deal with a lot of things that I knew I would like salmonella and E. coli and listeria and some of the pathogens that we study. However, what I've learned is that most things that happen on a daily basis are things that I wasn't uh, expecting. One of the biggest things that we have been addressing is PFAS, which is a chemical contaminant in the water supply that has become an agricultural contaminant. We spend a lot of time on that. And then, as you know, uh, working with uh, COVID-19 and dealing with that. And I will talk more about the details of that later. So um, you can see here a representation of working with the secretary, working with the Senate, working with Congress and some of the things that we have had going on in um, over the past year. I've been in the job now for uh, one year and about almost two months. So to give you some details on FSIS or the Food Safety Inspection Service, which is the agency that I oversee, we have a lot of responsibilities. Most people think about FSIS and they think about food inspection, which is very accurate. Most of our employees do work as food inspectors. We are the largest uh, federal employer of veterinarians. And so we're always looking for good vets to come and work with the FSIS and that's very important. We oversee 6,500 federal establishments across the country, as well as uh, 150 import inspection establishments. We oversee the safety of imported and exported product as well. We have uh, more than 150,000 in-commerce facilities nationwide. So we have a lot of facilities that we are responsible for. Every food product, with under USDA inspection, which would be meat, poultry, and egg products. And just by the way, meat includes catfish. We now have catfish. That was a, a part of a recent change in our inspection responsibilities. So those are the things we inspect. Every one of those products has continuous inspection. That means every live animal is inspected for animal health, and then every single carcass is inspected. So it's a huge responsibility, and we're uh, dedicated to making sure that we maintain the presence in, uh, in food companies and making sure that our food supply stays safe. In addition to food inspection, we also have three labs across the country. These labs process more than 2 million samples every year looking for microbial contaminants as well as chemical contaminants in our food supply and they play a huge role in keeping our food supply safe. We also have a group of scientists in DC as well as in Atlanta housed with the, the CDC that investigate and trace back outbreaks. So we're always looking at the trends and all of the things going on with foodborne outbreaks, what's reported back to the CDC uh, from our public health labs. I'm happy to tell you I had a recent briefing and we can say there are no foodborne outbreaks going on right now. So that is one spot of good news. We also have a huge group of uh, staff that are focused on communication. Our communication teams uh, deal with the media on uh, congressional issues, as well as consumer issues. We are the uh, agency that has the meat and poultry hotline. We have uh, the hotline available uh, five days a week, and we're even open on Thanksgiving Day to answer consumer questions about safe food handling and how to keep your turkey safe or your ground beef safe or whatever it may be that you're trying to cook. Now, we 
do all these things on a regular basis, we get in a routine, but then some things happen that we don't expect and we have to go into a mode, uh, a different mode of operation. Currently, we are operating under our pandemic action plan. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what's going on um, within the USDA and specifically at FSIS to keep your food supply safe and most importantly, to keep your food supply moving and available. First of all, I wanna say that there are no food safety issues associated with COVID-19. It is not a foodborne pathogen, it's a respiratory pathogen. And so it is, uh, food is not considered a, a source of transferring the pathogen from person to person. There are no documented cases of this happening and that's a very positive thing because it helps us keep our food supply moving and on the supermarket shelves. Currently, our uh, food employees requ are required to operate under st sanitation standard operating procedures. These procedures are uh, procedures for cleaning. They also include procedures for hand washing and for wearing gloves if necessary and PPE in a food processing establishment in order to prevent food contamination from an employee. Those current practices actually also protect our food supply from being contaminated uh, when the employee could potentially be getting sick. So obviously we don't want any sick employees or inspectors ever in a plant, but they may have uh, be carrying the illness and not be sick yet. So we have procedures in place to prevent food contamination from employees. I wanna assure you that there are currently no shortages of meat and poultry in the US. Now your supermarket shelves may be empty. This is not due to a lack of food in the food supply. This is due to employees or due to consumers going to the supermarket, overbuying, hoarding and panic buying. This is not necessary. We don't need this to happen. You can go to the store each week, buy your product just as uh, you have in the past. Uh, I understand how you feel. This, uh, this hit Washington DC uh, two and a half weeks or so ago. We experienced the same thing, even the lack of toilet paper. But uh, my husband and I went to the supermarket this weekend. The shelves were fully stocked. People were not buying uh, tons of groceries and uh, the, the supply chain had caught up with uh, the panic buying. So I wanna assure you there are no shortages at this time. We do have a, a supply chain task force. I'll talk to you uh, more about that uh, later, but we are committed to have timely delivery of our services and our food. Another thing I want to make sure that, to assure you of, is that under our pandemic action plan, we are committed to providing food inspection and to having inspectors in our plants. There is some worry that um, if we don't provide inspectors in the plant, that our food supply could uh, be threatened because if there's no inspector, then the plant doesn't operate. However, under this plan, we have uh, procedures in place for moving employees around, making sure that our plants are fully staffed and the food supply stays uh, inspected. And then finally, we are having daily calls multiple times a day. We're connecting with the industry to make sure that uh, their needs are met. If there are certain things that arise, we address that. And uh, we have a lot of flexibility now to take regulatory actions uh, and flexibility in order to keep the food supply going. So a few things that we have done uh, last Monday, and this actually seems like a lifetime ago, but under Secretary Iba, who uh, is over the Ag, uh, AMR, Ag uh, Marketing Section, he and I put out a letter. You can get the full letter on our website. In the gist of this letter, we wanted to assure the public that we are committed to maintaining the movement of the American food supply from the farm to the table and also ensuring that we would provide inspectors and graders and all those uh, government employees to the plant so that our food supply uh, was, was present, present on the shelves. And we still 
feel very confident in this and we have not had any uh, problems with this and we look forward to continuing to being flexible every day so that our food supply stays on the shelf. The second thing that I want to point out, and this uh, was released last Thursday, I mentioned we have a COVID-19 supply chain task force. The USDA is leading this and I'm overseeing uh, the actions of this within our agency along with other USDA employees. We are working with FDA, CDC, the White House, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Homeland Security on this supply chain. The president announced on March 16th that essential workers should be able to go to work. They needed to meet those essential uh, operations in, uh, in our population. However, agriculture and food was not necessarily specified uh, directly in these uh, announcements. So we worked with the Department of Homeland Security, specifically uh, CISA, their agency that oversees these operations, and they came out with this letter. Again, this letter is available, and this letter declares agriculture and food processing as essential entities within the United States. This will allow our food workers to continue working and producing and manufacturing foods during the pandemic. This also includes times of shelter in place or quarantines or curfews. And if needed, this letter can be printed out and taken uh, with food uh, employees with them. It can be shown to authorities to show that they're essential workers and that keeps agriculture working and moving and our food supply moving as well. The next thing that uh, we announced yesterday, we had a verbal commitment on this with our industry groups on Friday, was uh, to take some regulatory discretion in uh, the utilization of labeling rules in order to move our food from uh, food destined to food service or to school lunches to move those to retail operations. A lot of times when food is uh, put out by a processing plant in a food service setting or something that's destined for a school, it's not labeled. Individual packages within uh, the box aren't fully labeled as we need on the retail shelves, or it may be packaged in bulk. And so um, it's not really appropriate for re the retail shelf. But well, we didn't want all of this food that was sitting in a warehouse to be sent back to the plant for relabeling. Uh, that would tie up our trucks in transportation. It would also uh, could have an impact on the availability of packaging. It would take away food workers from making new product. So uh, we were able to put out guidance documents. Again, this is on our website uh, in full. This is only uh, the front page of it but the guidance documents tells um, how this product can be moved directly from the warehouse to retail and putting uh, some labels on there that don't necessarily meet all the full retail label requirements, but we're still moving the product and we're still getting it to the shelves and it's not going to waste. With school closings, with uh, restaurant closings, uh, there was an abundance of this in the food supply chain and we have done this in order to move food and get it to our consumer. And then last of all, I just want to give you some of our guidance, uh, uh, some of the guidance documents that we have put out. Uh, and this is something that needs to be followed by anyone in the population and anyone who isn't necessarily, who's actually going into the office uh, because they're an essential employee. Um, we, obviously, if you're sick, you need to stay home. You need to uh, take actions to have increased hand washing and utilizing hand sanitizer, making sure uh, things are safe. Uh, some things you might not think about is like sharing a pen or sharing your cell phone. If you have a picture on your phone and someone is there and letting them look at it, that can be a source of contamination. Use hygiene, good hygiene me measures, no matter what you're touching or handling. Obviously social distancing, that's what we're all doing. This is going to be very important to prevent the spread of COVID-19. 
reducing or eliminating in-person meetings. That's what we're doing today, so this is good news. And then finally, uh, following State Department travel guidance guidances. You can look on the State Department where they uh, put out areas of risk. Right now, uh, this, this involves uh, both traveling internationally as well as traveling within the U.S. That's another way to transfer uh, the, the virus. We want to prevent that and minimize travel as much as possible. So that gives you an overview of what we have done. Uh, on the pandemic side, I can answer questions about that. And now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, the vision for FSIS and what we have coming up in the coming months. I have spent the past year getting to know the agency. Um, I came as a, in as a scientist. I had a lot of expertise in you know, so, uh, being a scientist and being in academia and, and being uh, our director of our center. However, that didn't mean I knew how to run a federal agency with over 9,000 employees and a $1.1 billion budget. And I needed to get to know the agency, so I've spent a lot of time doing that. I have visited processing plants and our inspectors in plants. I have visited many universities. The relationship with universities is very important in order for us to understand what's up and coming as far on the scientific side, as, far, as well as recruiting future employees. I have developed relationships across the government, very strong relationships with CDC and, uh, and FDA. I've been out and given many speeches, uh, probably, at this point, close to 45 or 50 speeches in the past year, and I have an amazing speechwriter, an amazing team of uh, communication specialists who helped me do that. I definitely do not do that on, on my own. So I really appreciate them and give a shout out to them. Um, I have visited China and Australia and New Zealand, and in these international trips, I have worked with the government agencies, We've worked on specific details uh, with the China trade deal and, and making routes of trade whenever we went there in foreign countries. I visited slaughter plants and uh, processing plants as well as with the government uh, entities there in order to keep the food supply safe around the globe. And then I visited our labs and also our HR center, our technical center. And as I've done this, I really came uh, in my mind uh, in December, it was a really slow time at uh, FSIS, just slow in that we weren't traveling as much. I sat down one day and just started kind of thinking back about what I had learned in the past year. And I just started typing. I, was, I came from academia, I like to write, and I wrote out an 18 page document. And I think it also had an appendix. It was a very long document. Again, I have great, uh, people who made that, you know, more concise and, and a better communication tool and help me come up with three areas where we will be emphasizing our efforts uh, within FSIS. Those are leading with science, influencing behavior changes, and building relationships. And this is really our focus in the uh, weeks and months to come. Now, leading with science. Um, I am a scientist and uh, my, my foundation in science has remained very strong and, and I appreciate that. We have a great team of scientists at FSIS that I get to work with on a daily basis. However, my approach to science is much different now. I have the responsibility of protecting the, the, the population of the United States from getting a foodborne illness. I take that very seriously and we have to make very sound data-driven and science-based decisions. In my position, I have people who come into my office all the time and they have ideas and they, have, uh, they want us to consider proposals and, and data that they have. However, what I've learned, a lot of things that, that are brought to me are not actual data at all. They're actually anecdotal uh, pieces of information. If we utilize anecdotes to make policy decisions, we will not protect public health. So I'm committed and dedicated to making sure that we use very sound data-driven and science-based decisions. Now, I'm gonna go back to my roots a little bit. Uh, 
as, uh, as we've already said many times, I was a professor at Texas Tech. I served as a director of the International Center for Food Industry Excellence. So I can always go back, look back fondly to Lubbock, my time there, my time at Texas Tech, that gave me this solid foundation in science. Without that, I wouldn't be able to uh, look at a lot of this information that's brought to me from other entities. It looks really nice. Everything's all, always very nicely packaged, but then when you dig into it, you see it's not actually a scientific document. It's actually, like I said, a collection of anecdotes. So I'm very thankful for my time at Texas Tech, where I grew as a scientist all the way through the process from assistant professor, uh, to associate, and then ultimately to full professor and as a senior faculty member. Uh, very valuable time there, and I'm thankful that um, it led me to where I am today. Some of the things uh, briefly that we're doing specifically that are very important on the scientific side, uh, we have a strong pl plan in place, and we will be rolling this out in April, where we are specifically targeting salmonella. Our actions tie back directly with public health goals and specifically Healthy People 2030 goals where we want to reduce salmonella in our food supply and reduce uh, the amount of illnesses we see in the human population. So not only do we wanna reduce the amount of salmonella we find in poultry or in beef or in pork, we want that to correlate back to what we see as a public health issue. In doing that, we have several research priorities established. We're testing lymph nodes in cattle. We have an interagency group that's studying the virulence factors of salmonella. And uh, there's stuff going on every single day in order to meet those goals. In addition to the scientific, or to the scientific uh, actions we have going on within our scientific team, we also have several policies in place that address salmonella. In my introduction, you heard that we were able to implement modernized swine inspection. This happened back in, seven, uh, in September of last year of 2019. I thought it would be the hardest thing I would face in this position. Needless to say, the past 10 days have uh, been uh, put me on a different path. We're always going to face a new challenge, but then whenever you face a new challenge and you get through it, it makes you stronger and better equipped to make wise decisions for the next challenge that comes along. But with our modernized inspection, we know that uh, this is food safety based. We're focusing on tasks that are related to public health and food safety, and uh, we'll start having plants roll into that very soon. We are also implementing performance standards. We already have performance standards in place for salmonella and poultry, but we have proposed performance standards in place for pork or for beef and for Campylobacter in poultry, and soon we will be rolling out performance standards for public comment for salmonella and pork. So we'll cover all of our major meat products with performance standards to see how we're doing in controlling salmonella. As I've already mentioned, we have research priorities. We put out guidance documents for the industry on how to meet our standards. We have petitions that we uh, respond to. We make decisions on international equivalency, and we are expanding our accredited lab program where microbiology labs across the country can be an accredited FSIS lab, and that way we can have more capacity for testing our food supply. So the next goal that I have is building relationships. I believe that at the core of every successful organization is uh, strong relationships. And I can look back over the past year and we spent a lot of time building relationships with the FDA and the CDC. I, uh, previous to this job, I already knew Frank Giannis very well. He is a deputy commissioner, commissioner of foods. He started about a month before I started, but we have been able to communicate practically seamlessly every single day during uh, this uh, COVID outbreak, and, and we did in the past, but we've had a very strong relationship. 
he and I, he is responsible for any FDA regulated product, which would be anything that isn't meat, poultry, or egg products. So he has the rest of the food supply. But we have been in lockstep on our recommendations to the industry. And then we loop, loop back to the CDC to make sure that our decisions are science-based and data-driven in order to protect our food supply and protect the health of our workers and the health of our uh, food industry workers as well. Now relationships, I don't have to uh, t tell you that West Texas has the best hospitality. Like I said, I get on the Metro every day. Well, I was getting on the Metro every day to get to work. And you get on the Metro and it's silent. It'll be packed with people, but people don't talk to you. You don't get a lot of eye contact. I've often thought, what if there was a Metro in Lubbock, Texas? I don't think it would be so quiet. Everybody would be saying, hey, what are you doing? What happened this morning? What happened at work? Even if you didn't know, people would talk to each other and you had a lot of hospitality. I'm a very social person. So I think that that's really driven me to the building relationship part of my vision. I think relationships are very important and they drive and make a success, successful organization. Now, we have to have a lot of relationships in FSIS, not only within the department, but across agencies. We have to have a good relationship with Congress. Congress, uh, they provide us with our funding and our budgets. They also send us letters from time to time. I've often said, usually the letters don't say, hey, you're doing a great job. They're usually asking us, why did you make that decision? The good thing is I feel we make really good science-based decisions. We can explain those decisions, but we have to have a good relationship there so the communication flows back and forth smoothly. We also have good international partners. I have a very good re a relationship with my counterparts in Mexico, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, China, all of these major countries so we can make international decisions for food safety. I had a call uh, last week with uh, my counterpart in Canada. So we're also in lockstep in our recommendations for how to deal with COVID-19 during this pandemic. We have our federal partners, as I've already mentioned, with FDA and CDC and others. Now we have the Department of Transportation in there, HHS, and many other uh, partnerships that are very important in order to keep our food supply going. And then our stakeholders, which would be consumer groups as well as industry groups. We meet with them once a month, and now we're talking to them many times a day. Another important relationship, and I've already touched on this, is our relationship with universities. We're staying on top of the science, and we also have employment opportunities within the FSIS. We can hire uh, consumer safety inspectors at the BS level. These are inspectors that review documents and records. And then we have our public health veterinarians. So we have developed relationships with vet schools across the country. So when those uh, individuals who are in vet school, they know that FSIS is an opportunity where they can get a job when they get out. Few people go to work for the, or go into vet school with the goal of coming out and working for the FSIS, but we hope that that attitude changes in the years to come. And finally, the last thing I wanna mention is influencing behavior changes. This is one of the hardest things. I have been talking about hand washing for the past year. I have been doing interviews with uh, different radio shows. I have been putting out all of this messaging on Twitter and social media on washing your hands. And I'll get to some data we have on that in just a minute. The other day, my dad called and said, hey, I heard you on rural radio today. My dad is from Wheeler, Wheeler, Texas. I think he was out driving around and probably checking the cows or something. I said, oh, what was it about? And he said, hand washing. I did that interview months ago, but I always say hand washing is important, not only for food safety, but also for any public health issue. As you know, hand washing is in the news now. 
unfortunately, it's driven by a public health crisis. That is one way we can get behavior changes, but we want behavior changes to come not just from a public health crisis, but because we're getting the information out and as an educational opportunity. Now, I'll go back again to my foundation. I'm an educator. I love teaching. I love interacting with students. And that's really the foundation of, of what drives me to want behavior changes. Uh, also, my husband, he is a professor at Texas Tech. This is his area of research. He has done a lot of work on this, and he has given me a great uh, appreciation for the importance of not only teaching someone something, but also making sure their behavior changes. So like I mentioned, uh, we're very focused on consumers. We have our meat and poultry hotline. We have the questions that can be asked on that hotline. It, um, it's out there and we found that the questions are kind of the same from year to year. And so we did a little bit of research with North Carolina State University. We have a lot of data on this, but what I wanna emphasize is what we found about hand washing. This was during food preparation. They brought people in, gave them raw poultry or a, a turkey patty to handle, and then they had to make a salad. We, uh, this was all videotaped. They observed how often they should have washed their hands. There were 1,145 times during the study that people should have washed their hands, and only 1% of those individuals attempted to wash their hands at the right time. We've had this data a while, we've been talking about it, but hopefully now if we look at this data, it will be different and people will be washing their hands more often. So with that, I will wrap up. We are definitely committed to addressing uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and doing whatever we can to keep our food supply moving. We are talking about this multiple times a day, and we're, I assure you that our food supply is moving and there's, there are no limitations at this time, and we are committed to keeping it that way. So with that, I wanted to ask you to stay healthy, stay safe, wash your hands, and I'm gonna uh, build on the Secretary's Purdue's motto, which is do right and feed everyone. At FSIS, we say do right and feed everyone safely. With that, I will take some questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. I know it's an unprecedented, unprecedented time that we're living in and we really appreciate everything that you are doing as well as your assurances to us about the food supply um, and, and, and the abundancy uh, that we do have as well as its safety. So I'm, gonna kick, I'm, I'm going to kick it off with, okay. uh, with the first question. I would again suggest that anyone that has questions, if you would please use the chat function, uh, which you'll find the icon um, at the bottom of your screen, uh, your Zoom screen. If you'll please submit your questions via the chat function, we'll be able to communicate those. Um, the first question I have though is, is what can we do as um, people that are not with USDA necessarily, those of us that are agricultural um, advocates out here um, or members of the business community in a, in a community where agriculture is one of our economic foundations, what can we do in terms of communicating uh, your message, communicating about food safety and helping you do your job? Yeah, that is a great question because you are on the front lines. You are providing the information. You are a trusted source of information as well. Uh, we have uh, lots of information on our website. If you just go to the USDA.gov, you'll find the, the COVID website and you can get all of our talking points and everything. It's on the main page. So you can get the information there. But I think the most important thing you can do is to stay engaged with the public. Uh, you want to reassure them. Right now, when, when there's a lack of information, people are going to fill the information with what they find on social media. It may not be accurate, and this creates a panic. So um, our uh, public health, our, our individuals, leaders in uh, communities are really on the front line of providing that accurate information and providing a 
a, a calm environment. Now, is this serious? Yes, it's very serious, but there's no need to panic. We have plans in place. We uh, don't need to go and hoard food. We don't need to think, um, you know, everything is coming to an end. We do have to separate. It's a different way of life, but, but being able to communicate that and reassure the public is very important. Uh, and so I really encourage you to do that uh, through social media, through the news stations, through radio, any outlet you have to reach those consumers uh, is very, very important. Uh, later on today, um, I have a conference call with all uh, the local and state public health labs, and um, I'm gonna give them the same message. They are on the front lines and they need to communicate accurate messages that are uh, out there, science-based, data-driven, and we need to share information that's accurate. So thanks for the question, and thanks for what you do. I had a, a question submitted via the chat tool, and that is, um, are uh, research and development staff within FSIS considered essential and critical? Um, all of our staff are considered essential. We are still uh, working. We have um, most of our staff uh, at headquarters are teleworking. Uh, those at the senior level, we are uh, on a very skeleton crew in the building. I will uh, probably be in next week. We really take it on a day-to-day -day basis, but all USDA employees are still working and FSIS employees are considered uh, critical. Our scientists are still working. I have conference calls. I have interaction not only with our scientists, but with our communication team at this time. So still working and still doing their job every day. Okay, I think we may have one more question. Let me see if I can check it. Um, no, I think that's it. Um, Norma, can I ask a question real quick? Sure, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Bashirs. this is Kyle Jacobson. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, I've got a question about what I kind of perceive to be a growing trend about certain diets that uh, exclude uh, beef, chicken, dairy, um, and there seems to be some misconceptions about GMO, gluten, all that. Um, and obviously that harms um, particular industries um, within the ag and livestock sectors. So is USDA doing any sort of uh, PR campaign or information campaign to um, clarify any of that for people? Uh, that's, that's a great question. That's a very broad question. Um, on uh, for, as far as FSIS goes, we oversee um, meat, poultry, and eggs, and so we provide information on that. We do have another branch, FNS, Food and Nutrition Services, and I'll give a shout out to Deputy Un Undersecretary Brandon Lips, who is also from Lubbock, so we are just really fortunate at USDA to have a, a good uh, presence of people from uh, from West Texas, but he oversees FNS and, and they have nutrition information um, uh, that they put out and they oversee that. So I encourage you to go to their website. However, uh, your question actually uh, brought up something that people might be wondering about. One is uh, plant-based proteins and then also cell-based meats. And so I wanna address that because that falls under many of the things that we do. First of all, on the plant-based proteins, um, the Beyond Meat and Beyond uh, Poultry products, those types of products, those are plant-based. Those are overseen by the FDA. We are working with the FDA for accurate labeling of those products. The term meat, the term beef, the term chicken has a standard of identity. The standard of identity is uh, something that comes from an animal, but that falls under USDA. So it becomes a little difficult for FDA to enforce our laws, but they're willing to work with us. They're working on the labeling. The labeling of some of those products uh, should be changing and updated to be more accurate to represent what they are. There are more issues than just uh, being misleading. It could be an issue on nutrition or um, if we have an outbreak, someone might have thought they ate beef, but it was actually not beef and, and lots of things in there we have to consider. 
on cell-based meats, which would, these are um, food, meats that are, you know, talked about grown in a petri dish or something like that. We also work with FDA to oversee the jurisdiction of those. Frank Giannis and I signed a, a joint MOU about a year ago on uh, overseeing the inspection of these products. And FDA will oversee the cell lines that produce the product. And then once it becomes a food product, we will oversee that. We're working on labeling, accurate labeling, and we plan to move forward with a public process uh, to develop standards of identity and labeling for these products so consumers know what they are and they are accurately labeled as well. We have time for one more question. We had one more submitted via the Zoom and that, or via the Zoom chat, and that is, and this may be a little bit broader than your section of the agency, uh, but during the current pandemic, how is USDA working to support communities that are sheltering in place? Oh, well, um, USDA has many opportunities there. And, you know, like I've mentioned, providing food and uh, making sure that our, our food supply stays uh, abundant, that everyone is fed. That's, that's one of the, the biggest things. Um, as I said, FNS, they also oversee the school lunch program. I was just talking to Brandon uh, this morning and they are making sure that the school lunch is distributed through our school system. And then uh, we're working on some food safety guidance there and uh, uh, guidance for them so they don't uh, transfer the virus as they are handing out these meals through the school. So Secretary Purdue took an action I think it was last week, to make sure that our students who needed the school lunch lunches were still fed during this time. He is having a stakeholder meetings, uh, Secretary Purdue is, uh, with larger uh, ag industries on, you know, every two or three days. People can call in, ask him questions, and then we have a uh, an email set up. It's uh, food supply chain at usda.gov. If you have any question in the food supply chain, which by the way, includes live animals. We made sure that live animals were included whenever this uh, food was declared essential or a production issue. If you're you know, concerned about getting seed or fertilizer, that's all a part of the supply chain. Those can be submitted to that email and they are answering all of those. So we have a lot going on uh, to support agriculture, to support uh, communities that are facing these difficult situations. Great. Before we go, I'd like to say thank you again to our presenting sponsor, First United Bank, and to all of our sponsors who we hope to see in person as soon as we can. We look forward to celebrating the contributions of agriculture to our economy and society someday again soon when large gatherings are safe. In the meantime, please join the chamber in getting the word out about agriculture and National Ag Week on social media. Our Facebook and Twitter accounts are sharing information from the National Ag Day website about American agriculture and all of its benefits to our country, especially in these days that we face today. We are going to leave you with a video from First United Bank, if I can figure out the technology, and I'm sure that I can. Thank you again to Undersecretary Brashears. Congratulations, and we Thank really you. appreciate you. So Thank you so me. much for having me. Absolutely. I'm going to switch now over to a, a really nice note from our sponsors at First United Bank that I think we could all use this boost today. So please join me uh, in viewing this important video. Greatest possession is his dignity, and that no calling can bestow this more abundantly than farming. I believe hard work and honest work are the building blocks of a person's character. I believe that farming, despite all of its hardships and disappointments, is the most honest and honorable way a man can spend his days on earth. I believe farming nurtures the close family ties that makes life rich in ways money can't buy. I believe
believe my children are learning great values that will last a lifetime and can be learned no other way. I believe farming provides an education for life and that no other occupation teaches so much about birth, growth, and maturity in such a variety of ways. I believe that many of the best things in life are indeed free. The splendor of a sunrise, the rapture of wide open spaces, the exhilarating sight of your crops greening each spring. I believe that true happiness comes from watching your crops rising in the fields, your children grow tall in the sun, your whole family feels a pride that springs from their shared experience. I believe that by my tool, I am giving more to the world than I am taking. An honor that does not come to all men. I believe my life will be measured ultimately by what I have done for my fellow men, and by this standard, I fear no judgment. I believe that when a man grows old and sums up his days, that he should be able to stand tall and feel pride in the life he has lived. I believe in farming. I believe in farming. I believe in farming because it makes all this possible.